In this video we continue our look into Adobe Camera Raw, the shooting and manipulation of raw images and the subject here is Smart Objects. Smart Objects extend the life of raw files into Photoshop's layers. We already have the ability to save an image from Adobe Camera Raw, that button down at the extreme bottom left and when we use that we can retain the raw status of one image as a digital negative, a DNG. But to do that in Photoshop or something similar we need smart objects. Whenever we're working in Adobe Camera Raw we're working in a non-destructive way. We can click that done button down at the extreme bottom right and then when we come back and open up the same picture from Bridge we can open it up as a raw image and we can take up the manipulation from where we left off. Whenever we open up an image from within Adobe Camera Raw into Photoshop we're no longer then working on a raw image unless of course we open it up as a smart object and to do that we need to turn on the smart object status. So let's do that before we go any further. Let me just draw your attention to the buttons down at the extreme bottom right. You'll notice the one on the left of the three where we would normally open the image into Photoshop it says open image. I'd like to take you now to the center bottom of the screen to the hyperlink. It contains quite a bit of information that little string there but we need to click that because the option I want to take you to is this one. We're going to open in Photoshop as a smart object and when I click OK now we can see the button at the bottom right the one that's on the left now says open object rather than open image. Now this is a favorite workflow of mine and it's how I edit many of my own images. It's just a different way to reach the same ends but it does allow us to work in Photoshop's layers with perhaps more than one copy of the image in question while retaining two or more layers as raw images. I find that smart objects give me a greater flexibility because they enable me to work with raw files and manipulate two different exposures from the same subject. One of the exposures may be with a well exposed foreground but perhaps the sky is very weak and the other may have a very good sky but a not so good exposure in the foreground. I can open up two manipulated images from Adobe Camera Raw into Photoshop and work in layers and retain the raw status. Now what I can also do with smart objects is to open up more than one version of the image we're currently viewing in Adobe Camera Raw. Once I open up a raw image like this as a smart object into Photoshop, whether it's got one layer or five layers, I can save the whole thing as a Photoshop file. But I can come back into that Photoshop file tomorrow or next week and I still have access back into Adobe Camera Raw to pick up any manipulation where I left off. Very versatile. To begin the work on this picture you can see I've already visited the lens corrections and ticked to remove chromatic aberration and to enable the profile corrections. I've also rotated the image just a little bit with my straighten tool I know there's no horizon in this but it did have the feel that it was leaning one way so if I just touch my crop tool you'll see what I did not much but a little but of course our crop always remains live so I'm just going to touch the enter key but now I can consider what I want to do with the image itself and to do that I can go back to the basic tab and the first thing we need to do as always is to look at that histogram now we can see we've got quite a nice looking histogram but we've got a few peaks on the right hand side and that area up there on the right is obviously being fed from the lighter sky. Well what I'd like to do here is to create two copies of this particular image. 
one where I work through most of the foreground and the hills and one for the sky. So what I've got to do here is I've got to look at the histogram but I've got to bear in mind that I'm not too concerned what I do to the sky while trying to get the bottom half as close to what I want as I can. Now one of the tools that I've tactfully ignored up to now if we move over to the sliders on the right hand side just above them we have an auto button. Now I very rarely use this but sometimes it can be useful if we just click the auto button we could either accept the changes it's given us because all of the changes will be within parameters set by Photoshop or we could use that as a stepping off point. Now you may find that auto button is quite useful particularly when you're first getting into making these types of changes in Adobe Camera Raw but what I'll do is I'll click the default and I'll start from scratch because what I want to do here is to give a healthy amount of clarity, a bit of impact. I want to put a nice bit of colour in there so I make the most of that autumn colour from the bracken or the fern that was growing on the hillside. Looking up at my colours, I think my colours look about right but I'm never really certain so I may go up to the top left and select my eyedropper tool now a neutral colour is what I'm looking for let's try over on the left hand side by the left of the railway line and click now that's turned it a little bit on the green side but it's not unattractive is it let's try it over here on the gravel that looks pretty neutral I think I like that a little bit better but I think we've got a bit of a magenta cast in there but not much but what we can do to reassure ourselves that the eyedropper tool is working reasonably well if I just keep it still and we look up at the histogram just below the histogram on the left you'll see there's three values red green and blue now they're all more or less the same which indicates that the color balance we've chosen from that point is about right because all three are more or less the same reading so if I come back to my sliders on the right hand side I'm going to take a look at just lifting the shadows a little bit maybe drop the blacks a little bit lift the whites a bit in the foreground because we don't have to worry too much about that sky so we're getting a nice bit of colour coming through there but I'm making all of the hillside look quite attractive but I've brightened up the road that runs through but maybe we can darken that down a little bit later what I'm also going to do is to have a look at the sky and look at the dust marks in the sky I can see one but let me pick up my spot removal tool I'll deal with that one that I can see instantly but when I tick the visualize spots box and adjust the slider it looks to me as though that's about the only one if you look up just underneath the histogram at the top of the screen you can see that the aperture used for this particular image was f5.6 now that's why fewer of the dust marks may show because we're not using a small aperture so let me touch the H key here and come back to my main set of sliders so what I'm looking at here is basically the hillside and the foreground but not the sky. I'm reasonably happy with that but just one final tweak I may just see if I just lift the temperature a bit just a tiny amount. I think what I'll do next is to open this up as a smart object into Photoshop. So here we have the image opened up in Photoshop and I've got my layers popped out from the right hand side and what you may notice on the thumbnail here is a little icon down at the bottom right. That little icon there is telling us we're working on a smart object. So I could save this as a Photoshop file now, walk away, come back next week and I can come back to exactly this point. So what I can do now is just double click that thumbnail it'll open back up into Adobe Camera Raw and I can continue manipulating the image from where I left off 
but what I want to do is to open up another version. Now we can always make a layer copy simply by hitting Ctrl J, but there's a problem with doing that in this instance. Now when I do hit Ctrl J, you can see that we do seem to have a good duplicate here, even retaining the smart object status. But what I'd like to do is to open up one of these images and adjust it for the sky, and the other image, which we've already done, that we've adjusted for the foreground. And if I copy them with Control J, whatever change I make to whatever layer in Adobe Camera Raw will affect both. So in actual fact, I can't use this one so I'm going to highlight it and delete it. What we need to do is to just go to the right of the thumbnail, right click and choose a new smart object via a copy. Now it looks exactly the same but now both of those layers have severed their link back to Adobe Camera Raw. So if I select this one and think of this as our, let me just double click that and I'll call this my foreground. Don't have to do this but it'll help maybe. This one is going to be the sky. Although it may be a little more than that, we'll see. So what I'm going to do here is open up this image back into Adobe Camera Raw and any changes I make will not impact this one. So let's do that, double click and we're back. First thing I want to do here is to, with my zoom tool, right click and open this up to 100%. Let's have a look at the sky. It looks pretty clean and smooth to me. I'll right click and look at it at 200%. So we don't have a major problem with noise here, and that's good. And the reason I was looking is because I do intend to push quite a bit of density into the sky if I can. I'll double click the hand to reset it. So now I can consider what I want to do to the sky. Let's drop the exposure down. We've got quite a blue tone there in the sky, which is probably quite natural. Whoops, I slipped a little bit then. Let's take it down a bit more. It's quite natural, but we've got to make a creative choice here, whether we want to just warm that a little bit or not. Now the beauty is we don't have to make all of our decisions in one go. You'll see in a moment how we can jump backwards and forwards from Adobe Camera Raw to the thumbnail in Photoshop as many times as we wish. I think I'd like to have a look at a bit of dehaze in the sky. That's putting a nice bit of impact into that. Maybe I'll even push up the clarity. Now sometimes when I do this sort of thing, I quite often go back to that zoom and I have another look at the sky. Let's go up to 100%, hold the space bar, click and drag. Just want to make sure that I'm not doing any damage. We can see now just a little bit of noise coming through. And for reasons I can't quite explain, I can seem, I seem to be able to see a dust spot there. So let me deal with that while I see it. But what I was gonna suggest was, if I go back to my main tabs and my detail tab and particularly the noise reduction. Just going to put a little bit of noise reduction in that sky just to compensate for me leaning on those sliders quite heavily. I'll double click the hand tool. That's not looking too bad. I think, no I think I'll live with that just for a moment. There's a little bit of weakness in the sky right at the very top. So I think I may just pick up my graduated filter and maybe just drag that down, go over to the right, a little bit more dehaze, maybe a bit more clarity, maybe a little less exposure. Not too keen on the blue that's appearing up there. Let's just drop that down a little bit. Felt that was a little too strong. So I'm just fine tuning that top edge just so that it balances a little bit better between the top and the bottom of the image. But of course what I can do now is click OK. Because what we're doing here by clicking OK, we're not opening up a smart object, we're just adjusting a smart object. So the image we're looking at here is the top layer, the foreground. 
and there's the sky. I've got a sneaking suspicion the sky may be a little too blue for me and I'd like to warm it a little bit but that's the beauty of working in this way. We can't really tell until we amalgamate both of these layers. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to stack all my layers up. I'm going to switch these around just for a moment. I'm going to drag the foreground at the bottom. So all we're looking at here is the sky. Selecting the sky, I'm going to hold my Alt key and I'm going to click down at the bottom of the layers to create a layer mask. It creates a layer mask completely flooded with black. So what we've effectively done is place this image over the top and then taken all the effects of it away by masking the lot away. So what I've got to do now is I've got to paint white on the mask to bring the sky of this shot into this one. Now that sounds a lot more complicated than when we actually do it, to be honest. Now to do that we need to go over to the left hand side. I need to make sure that I've got white as the foreground in my colour picker. So I need to switch that around. You can click the panel and make sure you do have white. There it is, right at the top left. From midway up the toolbox I need to select this option which is my gradient tool. And from the gradient tool options at the top of the screen I need this one here which is the linear gradient and in the drop down window next door I want foreground to transparent which is this option here. Now the gradient tool in Photoshop allows us to draw a line at any angle. Where the line starts we're going to be painting solid white. Where it ends it's going to be transparent hence the selection we made at the top left and in the middle it's going to be gradually soft. It's a graduated filter. I'm going to start just here. I'm going to use the angle of the hillside. So I'm just going to come across there and that worked pretty well. But then I have done this once or twice before. Now it doesn't matter if you don't get that gradient perfect. If I select the mask for example and I hit control backspace I can flood the mask with black and I can have as many goes as I like. So if I wanted to start a little further in and not go quite so far over the hillside if I think I'm going to get a better result you can see how we can manipulate that gradient to get the effect we're looking for. So this is the beauty of working with smart objects and multiple copies in layers because I can go back to my smart object as opposed to the mask double click and we're straight back into camera raw where we left off. So now I can experiment with maybe a little more warmth in the sky. Something that matches the foreground a bit more. I could take the opportunity to try pushing the blacks a little bit although it doesn't do a great deal to the sky does it? It does a little bit. Let's try the shadows. Shadows do. Let's try a little bit less exposure you can see what I'm doing here. I'm going to click OK once again and of course now we don't have to do anything at all. All we need to do is to sit back and say are we happy with that? Well yes I am although I'd like to do something with the area around the top of the hill because we made a gradient that came down across this area. So the effect of our gradient is over spilling the hill and that cloud and I'd like to do something with that well we can adjust the mask at any time using our brush but before I do that now I'm looking at my foreground and thinking that if I'm going to go with the sky with the impact it has does the foreground need to be slightly darker to match it well I'm going to have a look because I can go back to my foreground now which still retains our smart object status double click and we're straight back in where we left off. Now I don't think it needs much less exposure, let's just drop it down a little bit. Now sometimes if we've got areas such as here and here, if we wanted to lighten them just a little bit we could choose to use a brush but maybe we'll look at this in a different way as well. 
I don't want to do too much more. Maybe I'll take just a bit of color off now I've put more impact in. And once again, we can click OK, sit back and instantly gauge what we've done. Now I'm reasonably happy with that. Now at this stage, I would be saving this as a Photoshop file. I'm going to use that a little bit like a snapshot. So what I'm effectively doing is saying, so far, so good. When I move on and start making the next set of changes, if they don't go according to plan or I just change my mind, I can always come back to this point. Now I've got to work quite delicately here. And what I'm going to do is to select my mask. Now because the area I want to change is the white area at the top left, which is the area up here, then I need to switch to black. I'm also going to pick up a basic soft edge brush and I'm going to drop the flow rate down to something very low like 1% and the opacity I'll leave at 100%. I'll zoom into that hill, adjust the size of my brush because I just want to lighten the tones there just a little bit but not too much. You can see I'm trying to be quite delicate here lightening that cloud a little bit but not too much I think I went just a little too far here so in that case I can hit the X key which switches my colors from foreground to background so now I've got my white back and as you can see I can just adjust that and you would work a little bit more careful than me you would make the picture perhaps a little bigger and take a bit more care but I may also want to look along the edge again using black if I felt that the edge was a little dark but I think it's just about right so let's hit control zero and just do a little time out a little while ago I said I wasn't too keen on the density of the gravel road and this section over here on the left hand side so maybe I can do something with that because I do have a dark image here if I just hold my shift key and click the mask and turn it off you can see I've got the potential to make the foreground as dark as that not sure I want it quite that dark but I'll click the mask and bring it back into play but it does mean I'd have to spray white down in the bottom right corner so I can select it I'm going to keep my flow rate down quite low at least to start with to test the water so to speak and I'm going to start painting over this area that's a little bit slow so I'll increase the flow rate I've got the icon checked at the top of the screen so I can change the flow rate with the numbers on the keyboard so I'm going to make this 3% now you can see the brush is having a faster effect and maybe I've gone a shade too far I'm going to go back to 2% now I'm going to bring down the density along the foreground here along that gravel certainly around this area to push the impact into the picture then I'll need to zoom in in this area and do something over here adjusting the size of my brush that's going down quite slow so I'll increase that to 5% you can see now that I'm having a greater effect just to tone down these areas and the way we're working here I'll hit control zero the way we're working here is we could do something about the highlights on these posts now it's a small thing isn't it but I've got a light area right near the edge and it's against a dark background too so if I zoom into these and maybe if I push my flow rate up to I'll risk 20% here because what I want to do is very quick and dirty is to tone these down maybe that was a little bit ambitious of me 20% I'll knock it down to 10% by hitting the number one key but you can see I'm doing this very quick you would take a bit more care but these are the sorts of things that we may wish to deal with every picture is different as I keep saying and I picked up the wrong tool there I need to go and pick my brush up again I strayed over to the left hand side and 
inadvertently change tools as we do or hit a key I'm not sure what it's a trouble when you're recording a video you want to show all of the techniques but you're conscious that you're eating up video space at an alarming rate but I think you get a feel for what I'm talking about here you would make the image much bigger than I've done and you'll take a bit more care but it does make a difference doesn't it now I said earlier on that the area around here was a little bit maybe dark well it's not that bad really is it and around here but I'm going to lighten it just to help broaden out this technique so let me take the image we've got at the bottom which is the one we're going to need to adjust if I go to the right of that I can right click and I can make yet another copy if I double click that and take it into Adobe Camera Raw I can say right let's take off any blacks let's double click reset the exposure let's maybe bring the exposure up on those areas I'll take the magenta off a little bit let's click OK to that now what I'm going to do is to drag that to the top of the stack hold the ALT key and create a mask in black again now I can zoom in to the area I want to work I can select white as my foreground color I can go back to that soft edge brush make a slightly bigger brush here I'll drop the flow rate down to 5% so if I just wanted to bring up the tones in strategic areas and once again I'm working a little bit quick and dirty here but you can see how effective this method can be any other areas we wanted to raise around here well we can make that choice at any stage now I'm sure you've got the idea so I've just saved this as a Photoshop file so I can come back to my three smart objects but I'm going to go to the top right and for the sake of this demonstration choose to flatten the image there is one or two things I would like to do we do have some sheep on the hillsides here but they're so small they just look like little white specks which are distracting so I would be using my healing brush to deal with those now I fixed all of the distractions including the sheep on the hillside but there were many other small little distractions which were reflecting light towards the camera so I've dealt with those using the healing brush very quick and easy one last thing I'd like to do is to pick up my lasso tool because I'd like to do a similar thing that we've done in Adobe Camera Raw with the radial filter I'm going to draw a selection around the image I'm going to draw an irregular shape we can make it a more formal oval if we want and I can click and move it into the middle we've got the inside of this selection currently live and I need the outside because I want to darken the outer edges and corners to do that I need to go to my select menu top middle of the screen or top middle of the options select inverse now we can see the area we've got then we need to select a mask from the top left of the screen because this needs to be or the edge needs to be extremely soft come over to the right to the feather I'm going to type it in because it's a bit quicker 450 pixels and click OK now I'm working on a 20 megapixel image here the higher the resolution the more feather you're likely to need the lower the resolution the less feather you're likely to need to get the same sort of effects and where we hide that overlay in Adobe Camera Raw with the V key slightly different here it's control H for hide but it's still working now I'm just going to bring my levels on screen image adjustment levels I'll plonk them in the middle because it's the outer edge we need to view just going to move my midtone slider a little bit to the right you can see what I'm doing here and there's the image that I more or less happy with I think I might do just one or two small things but I'd probably leave them until tomorrow 
and I'd come back and take another look. And all I'm thinking about here is just lightening that cloud on the hill, maybe a touch, and maybe giving a touch darker to the darker clouds just above, but small things. So now we can sit back and view our finished work. If you want to view your images like this in Photoshop, just touch the F key and some of the surrounding window will be removed. Press it again and you'll get to this view and when you press it again you'll go back to where you started. And talking about where we started from, this is it. This is the untouched raw file. I'm not entirely sure why I like this way of working with smart objects, but I clearly do. Maybe it's just my own routine that I've built up over a fair period of time, and of course if we've got something that works, we're often reluctant to change that. When I'm working in Camera Raw, and if I'm using a lot of the tools, Let's say I've used the spot removal tool quite a bit, the adjustment brush, radial filters, graduated filters. Sometimes we go to add another graduated filter and as we click and drag to draw the overlay, it just lags behind our cursor a little bit, showing that we're putting a little bit of pressure on our computer. It's struggling just a little bit to cope. And I've also noticed that in Lightroom 2 in the develop module. We're working with smart objects of course, we're sort of sidestepping that so I haven't noticed that same effect while working in this way. But I suppose the most important part of image editing is to find our own sat-nav route and create that as our own personal routine.